What's up, YouTube? This is the 82 and 0 podcast. Continuing on, today we're going to talk about one of the most forgotten NBA stars in history, Jumpin' Johnny Green. Now, Johnny Green was born December 8th, 1933, in Dayton, Ohio. He would go to Dunbar High School. Although, while he was in high school, he didn't play basketball because he wasn't even six feet tall yet. He worked part-time in a bowling alley. And after graduation, kind of similar to Dennis Rodman's story, he hits a light growth spurt. But he did construction at a junkyard for about six months. And then he decided to join the Marines. So during the Korean, during the Korean War... It, he was, I think he was around 20 years old during this time. He was, he actually was listed in the Korean War, but uh, he ended up hitting a late growth spurt. Like I said, he comes up to six foot five and he played on the base's basketball team. The, uh, the Marine base football coach, Dick Evans, a Michigan State University, then college alumni, recognized Green's athletic ability and wrote a letter of recommendation to MCU, MSU, I'm sorry, basketball coach Forty, jo- Forty Anderson. Green by then was age 21 when he visited MSU in October of 1955. And, you know, I always like hearing these stories about late bloomers, like a Dennis Rodman or whatever. So after completing his military equipment commitment, Green enrolled at Michigan State in 1955, and he played on the 1955-56 Spartans freshman team. He became eligible to play varsity in January 1957 at age 23. Green played in 18 games that season as a power forward, setting a new Michigan State rebounding record with 14.6 per game, as the Spartans were Big Ten champions. They advanced to the NCAA tournament in the semifinal game, which they lost in triple overtime to the eventual champion, North Carolina, despite Green's 19 rebounds and 8 blocked shots. The Spartans finished the season winning 12 out of 13 games to end with a 16-10 overall record. As a junior in 1957-58, he increased his per-game rebounding average to 17.8 while averaging 18 points per game on an elite 53.8 field goal percentage. Now, he was named second-team All-American, and he was named third-team All-American by the Associated Press. In 58-59, he led the Spartans to another Big Ten title and a 194 record while falling short of the NCAA Final Four, averaging 18.5 points per game and 16.6 rebounds per game. He earned first-team All-American honors, and while he was in college, he married uh, his high his sweetheart, and she actually gave birth to his sons. He has two sons, Jeffrey and Johnny, and an an interesting fact about Johnny Green that I don't think a lot of people realize he had. To put him into a, like a modern comparison, he played a lot like, uh, what's a, he was like a Russell Westbrook in, in terms of his drive to the basket, but he, I'm not quite sure off the top of my head, maybe somebody could research this, what his vertical leap was. He had a pretty high vertical leap, and he was a very efficient scorer. Uh, for example, some of his seasons, like, I'll get into that later. Um, some of his seasons, he would get as high as 58% field goal shooting or 59. And he was an undersized power forward. He was six foot five, but it was his leaping ability and his strength that allowed him to get these rebounds, much like a Dennis Rodman. So... That's what my comparison would be. He's like a Dennis Rodman in terms of his rebounding and his jumping ability, but he scored more points than Rodman, and he had a better post game. So anyways, after his college career, uh, he was he was a first-round draft pick, the fifth overall 
in the 1959 NBA draft. He was selected by the New York Knicks. So going into the NBA, this is prior to Will, uh, Willis Reed being there. So this Knicks teams, these weren't very good teams in the early 60s. Uh, for example, his 59-60 season, they just won 27 games. So they had guys like Willie Knowles, Richie Guerin, and Johnny Green really, at the age of 26, wasn't initially a star right away. He only played 17.9 minutes per game. But by the 61-62 season, however, he became a full-fledged starter, putting up 34.9 minutes per game, making his first All-Star appearance, putting up 15.9 points per game, 13.3 rebounds per game, and his field goal shooting was going up. And I wish I could say his team had good success, but the Knicks... Never were really good in the early 60s. His best season, I would say, on the Knicks was 64-65, where he put up 11-7. and seven. I know the numbers dipped somewhat, but he still made an all-star appearance, and by this time, the team was starting to get a little better. They had Willis Reed on this team now, and so he'd play a couple seasons with the Knicks. But he started having some troubles with the Knicks organization. Uh, and they would trade him to Baltimore. Now, it was kind of a lopsided trade at the time. Although it, I think it ended up working out for both camps in the end. But they ended up getting Walt Bellamy. And... The funny thing was, is there was an expansion team at the time, the San Diego Rockets in 1967, and they drafted him as part of their expansion draft. And, you know, he'd play a season there with the Rockets, or I should say half a season, because in the 67-68 season, he would be traded to the Philadelphia 76ers for a fourth-round draft pick, which I don't think he ever even played Daryl Jones was the guy that was selected, but I don't think he ever even played. So he'd play two seasons in Philly, you know, that half season in 67, 68, and he played there in 68, 69. Now, at this point, it kind of looked like his career was somewhat over because at this point in 68, 69, he's 35 years old. He's only averaging 4.7 points per game and 4.5 rebounds. However, he uh, he would sign as a free agent with the Cincinnati Royals. And in the 69-70 season, it would be a bounce back for him because he'd put up 15.6 points per game, 10.8 rebounds, and lo and behold, he's now the field goal percent leader, averaging 55% field goal shooting. And... By 70-71, he'd put up 16.7 points per game on 58% shooting. So, he still had a lot of gas in the tank. And he makes an all-star appearance in 71. His final all-star appearance on the Cincinnati Royals. But by then, you know, Oscar Robertson's gone. The team isn't as good. So they don't, unfortunately, they don't win anything that year. And he would go on and play two more seasons there before retiring at the age of 39. He had a pretty long career for the time. He played it up until the time he was 39. And he's still alive today. He's currently 88 years old. And I feel like he's one of the most forgotten stars in NBA history. His, he had very good athleticism. Very fast, could jump out of the gym, great defender, great post moves. And I think the thing is about these 60s players, right? The ones who get forgotten are the ones who didn't win. So you always hear about Wilt, Oscar, Bob Pettit, 
Bill Russell, obviously, John Havlicek. But you never hear about the players that never won. And I don't think that's fair. Because a lot of these guys' stories need to be heard. And unfortunately, because there were no highlights, or I shouldn't say there's none. Because there wasn't a lot of highlights, I should say. A lot of times, these players just get forgotten altogether. And, you know, younger people, they don't care about these players. They don't care about the history. So, that's Johnny Green's story. Uh, I do know that after he got out of basketball, he entered the restaurant business. And he bought several McDonald's. And I don't want to say McDonald's was starting out then. They started back in the 40s, but this was like their expansion era. And he became very successful with expanding McDonald's. He uh, owned one in Springfield Gardens, New York, near JFK Airport. And he currently lives in Long Island, from what I've read. So that's Johnny Green's story. Let me know what you guys think down below. Thanks for watching. Feel you.